Matter, joined by Matthew Wright and Julia hartley Bro to discuss the headlines making the news today. Good morning to both of you. Thank you for Thank you. being here. So, I think we've all seen the scenes in Bristol over the weekend where a demonstration turns ugly. Officers suffered broken bones and police vans were set alight as protests turned violent in Bristol city centre. So, um, Matthew, just explain to us what was going on. I mean, these were protests that were people were protesting for the right to a peaceful protest, and then you end up with scenes like this. That's right. I mean, for the life of me, I don't understand why marching and protests are allowed during a pandemic full stop. We had anti-maskers wrestling with police on Saturday in London. I can't see my friends for a drink. Anyway, the Kill the Bill protest is in opposition to Priti Patel's new crime sentencing and courts bill. And people may think, well, this is exactly the new legislation we need to control violent yobbos like we saw uh, at work in Bristol. The trouble is we've already got laws that deal with violence at protest. The Public Order Act of 1986 uh, is, is perfectly uh, just and valid. What Priti Patel wants to do is, is sort of criminalise peaceful protest. Uh, she wants to make standing still at a protest illegal, as moving forward could also be illegal. You can be too noisy at a protest. And I think when we consider the anger and the the sort of tensions that have followed the murder of Sarah Everhard. We've got a serving police officer who's been charged with that crime. Um, I think, I, I think we, I think violence was 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 frankly on the cards, uh, and I don't think they've done any protesters any good. And so, as as and, we, we're saying there, uh, Julia, that the, the, you know, surely you don't campaign for the right to peacefully protest with violence. But at the at the same time, when you look at these uh, this new legislation. Um, it, it certainly appears to many that this is a serious infringement on your on your human rights, your right to protest. Indeed. Look, I, I, I'm personally the view that the right to peaceful protest should be enshrined in law forever and all time and, and shouldn't be taken away even during a pandemic. There's no evidence that any of the demonstrations that happened last summer caused any spikes at all in coronavirus. People outdoors, perfectly safely. We saw the anti-lockdown. It wasn't an anti-mask. It was an anti-lockdown uh, march very clearly on Saturday uh, and was almost entirely peaceful until uh, the very end with a few stragglers and, uh, and clashes with riot police. Um, but no, what so happened on... on but what happened on Sunday was, uh, I didn't interrupt you, Matthew, if it's OK. Uh, what happened on Sunday night uh, was, I think it was always, I agree with Matthew in terms of that, it was always likely to end in violence. If you call a protest, admittedly it's against a bill, but you call it kill the bill protest. You are setting yourself up for that. The scenes that we saw there were so disgusting. And in no way were those people campaigning for peace, the right to peaceful protest, which is what is being threatened by that bill, because they were violent campaigners. I mean, the violent protesters, they were criminals. They're, what they did was already illegal. But we saw not only 20 police officers Sorry. injured, two, two, two with broken arms. We saw police van satellite, a police station attacked. We even saw, I mean, this is absolutely horrific for anyone still eating their breakfast at this hour. Two people are on video defecating on the ground in front of police. I mean, absolutely disgusting behaviour. And none of it is justified by the cause that they claim they are fighting for. Matthew, you wanted to come in there. Well, um, the, the right to peaceful protest, like Judy, it should, it should be enshrined in law. Um, if you present a bill that isn't needed, that is a direct provocation to protesters, I think you have to accept that there may be some kind of pushback. I'm not justifying the pushback. I'm just saying that if Priti Patel hadn't drafted this bill, I'm not sure we would have seen those horrific scenes in Bristol. I'm really not. Can I, can I ask, Julia, if, 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 with, if, say, this bill were to go through and then you have a peaceful protest, um, but because of the restrictions on that peaceful protest, the police then come in, um, enacting whatever that bill happens to finally become, then surely a peaceful protest is more likely to become a violent protest. That's the worry. And again, it's very, very difficult. I was as annoyed as lots of Londoners were last year with the Extinction Rebellion uh, protest of the year before that. Um, the Extinction Rebellion protest that shut down the bridge nearest my office at the time, uh, which meant I couldn't, I couldn't get to work easily. I don't think you should have the right to shut down public rights of way for two weeks because you happen to believe strongly in the cause. That's different from someone having a right to peacefully protest, you know, in parks, in public places for shorter periods of time. Um, but I don't think you should be allowed to shut down the chance of someone protesting because one person is annoyed, which is effectively what this bill would allow. I think that goes too far. I think there is a middle ground where people still protest, but you don't have it based on one person says, oh, it's a bit too noisy for me and it gets banned. Yeah. I don't think 
we should do in a democratic society. All right, thank you. Let's move on to a different story now. The European Union moved to block vaccine exports to Britain on Sunday night, forcing Downing Street into a diplomatic push to secure supplies of coronavirus jabs. So, Matthew, the EU are sort of building walls around the distribution of the vaccines here, aren't they? Yes, it's a, it's a, a very unpleasant scenario. I, I, we have to start by acknowledging that none of us have seen either the EU's contract or the UK's contract with AstraZeneca. Their vaccines are made in the Netherlands. We've been getting all of ours. The EU says that AstraZeneca has not been uh, honouring their contract to deliver theirs. And without seeing those contracts, it's difficult to say who's right or who's wrong. I'm, I have to say that I am not a vaccine nationalist or a little England. I'm a, a global citizen and we won't deal with coronavirus properly until we can vaccinate the planet. We won't be able to go on holidays until our European brothers and sisters have had their vaccine. The EU is exporting vaccines. It's exported 34 million uh, vaccines, 9 million doses to the UK, and we have exported none. Okay. Uh, That's completely wrong. The EU hasn't exported any vaccines. A private company that makes vaccines for a client customer, the UK, uh, has exported those vaccines. It's got nothing to do with the EU. Uh, actually, we have seen one of the Good. contracts. We have seen the contract that was actually published. We have seen it. The, the, look, this is the EU trying to sort of just basically blame the UK for their own mess up. They signed a, a, a deal far too late. They signed a really poor contract. The wording wasn't watertight. We're getting our, our, our vaccines delivered and they're not. It's got nothing to do with the EU supply. They not get the, the vaccine now. Yeah. This may it's stop it. Do with the EU. The EU is just trying to make up the fact that they've messed up. What's extraordinary is we've got the EU demanding that they don't export uh, a, a jab, which only a week ago they were saying yeah. un was uns. That's the, ex saying that's the yeah. extraordinary thing when you look at this and 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 look at their behaviour. Um, that, as you say, a week ago they were wrongly saying that it uh, gave you blood clots, which the scientists and um, epidemiologists all say, no, hold on, hold on, this is this is not true. This is incorrect information. What it did do is it scared everyone in Europe. It scared a great many people in this country. Um, and so with that, it, it, it just seemed to be such a ludicrous thing to do. And then you're fighting for the vaccine, which a new study claims AstraZeneca mm -hmm. is 100% effective effective against serious illness. Exactly. I had the AstraZeneca Friday. And I'm really, I mean, I have to say, I felt very, very ill for about 30 hours. I really felt very dizzy and unwell, very bruised arm still, but I'm delighted to have had it. Um, and we know that it is a very safe vaccine. The vaccines are our route out of this. And what I think that the EU has done, Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron, I think is frankly unforgivable. I think they have cost lives. Uh, and I agree with Matthew, you know, this is a global issue. We need to solve this together. Um, but the one thing I don't want is for us to retaliate. Uh, we could actually retaliate by limiting supplies of, say, uh, a, a crucial ingredient that goes into the Pfizer vaccine, which is produced in Yorkshire. We should absolutely not do that. We should be, we should have the moral high ground and refuse uh, to go down to that level. And I think um, hopefully, hopefully uh, the EU will back down from what would be a terrible, terrible and immoral move. All right, let's mm. move on to another story here. This is uh, according to The Sun. Uh, Meghan Markle and Prince Harry's wedding certificate proves the couple did not wed three days before the Windsor ceremonies. These are new documents that have been obtained. The General Register Office's Office have revealed the couple's wedding certificate for the first time, proving they did get married on May the 19th at Windsor Castle. So, obviously, Matthew, this has led to people saying, well, there could be other factual inaccuracies in that Oprah interview. But, I mean... In their heads, I think what they were explaining, were they not, there was that for them there was a private ceremony, or do you think, you know, maybe there were other inaccuracies? Um, I, I'll be honest, I struggle to get to the end of, of the story because there does seem to be some kind of, of campaign. I, I feel there's a campaign uh, to get Meghan because of, there seems to be so much more interest in picking apart her story than there is in picking apart the stories of other royals who may be wanted for questioning by the FBI. Uh, it's, he said, she said, it seems entirely possible they would have had blessings and rehearsals if she thought that was the wedding, then uh, she thought it was but, the well, wedding. Aren't we, aren't we just assuming? She used the, she used the word wedding. Um, yeah. and, uh, and it was quite obviously, we all knew at the, at the time then, that can't possibly be what it was, yeah. um, because there were either the two of them and the archbishop, so you needed, you needed extra people. Um, and so I don't, I don't, we were talking about this this morning. I, I didn't take it as we got married. I took it as we, we had, a, had private a, a private ceremony, a kind of in blessing. In which case, you know, aren't, aren't people just 
piling in on her over the smallest of details. Don't you get one single word wrong, otherwise we'll be on you for that as well, Julia. Um, no, I, I completely disagree. I very much <laughs> saying that we had a private ceremony. I, my husband and I had a big wedding on a Saturday. We actually legally tied the knot in front of two witnesses in a registry office the day before because we weren't licensed for the number of people at like, the venue we wanted to be at. But we, we celebrate our wedding day on the day when all of our family and friends were there. But no, I very much took it as the idea that you know, they had got married. The archbishop said, no, that was a rehearsal. It was in a garden. There's a clue. You can't legally get married in a garden in this country. That was one of a heap of inaccuracies in what she had to say. If she's going to make complaints to ITV about your erstwhile colleague, Piers Morgan and what he says, I think we've got a right to actually examine what she says. If she wants to give her truth, I think we're allowed to uh, ask some detail for evidence to back up that truth. Fair enough. Um, finally, um, we've uh, we've got this one here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is an uh, Anne, finally. <laughs> this is uh, uh, nearly for him. Um, a a, a mum has taken to TikTok <laughs> to share a story of when her husband shared a picture of the couple and their newborn son seconds after he'd arrived. Um, in the TikTok, the mum reveals her husband forgot to crop her bare nether region out of the picture oh. before sending it to the entire family. I mean... So the whole family saw the whole thing. He was just so giddy and caught up in the moment, wasn't he? He just wanted to share this joy and then he shared a whole lot more. <laughs> Julia. Return oh. it's, it's, it's a confusing, it's a confusing and emotionally charged experience, and not just for the mum. And I guess the dad was so desperate to, to snap his son, he saw an opening and dived straight in, so to speak. <laughs> I have to... <laughs> I mean, as a mum who's had one of those pictures sent out, I'm really glad that it, it was cropped for me. I have to say, I mean, that that is just, that's just so, so awful for a dad to do that. Thank God it didn't go out to the entire world, though. Well, it has done oh, now. The smiling face. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, guys. Thank uh, Tracy, you. Uh, Tracy's oh. got in touch with us and said, I once sent a text to my husband saying, hurry up, back to bed, sexy bum, only to get a reply from his friend saying, was this meant for me? Oh, I no. sent it to him and my husband. Oh, no. Yikes. Oh, no. Oops.